keep saying this is my great privilege to introduce people all day long, and it is still my great privilege to introduce people. Um, it is such an honor to know folks, you know, for years and, and see them prosper and excel and then ultimately write a book. Um, so I just want to, um, to start off with my, on my far left, uh, Jerry Newman. Um, Jerry is a lecturer in the School of Engineering. Um, he is an engineer, um, a founder who was fired from his company by the VCs. Um, he has become an investor. He's invested in over 80 startups as an angel and advised many, many others. Um, interesting point, um, when I spoke to Jerry, you know, I told him what we were doing and he said, wow, I tried to do that at the School of Engineering 10 years ago. And I asked Jerry, how did it go? And what did he say? I don't know if I can say it. <laughs> um, all right, that, that question will go unanswered, which will tell you which is an answer in and of itself. Um, so um, Liz is someone who I got to know because I was friends with somebody who helped her start her latest company, the one that Jerry invested in, a Strong DM. And there are a couple of you here who know this company, right? Right, Suvid? Right, George? Okay. Yeah, a couple of people in the security space. And, um, and so because I know you, they got to know your company and that was inspirational. Um, so Liz is a serial entrepreneur, serial founder, been through several fundraising uh, rounds. She is one of the few people I know who actually says that she loves fundraising. <laughs> it's true, I love it. Right. <laughs> Which is like loving having a barbed wire shirt on your back. <laughs> so, okay, so we're going to go right into, we're going to go into this and we're going to start, start off a little bit soft because you know kind of how I operate, those of you who have, who, who have been in my classes. So, so Liz, like, like, how did you come to this entrepreneurship thing? Uh, hi. Um, I started my first company when I was in college. I went to school in Canada and I am American and so I couldn't get a job. And so I was finding clothes uh, in consignment stores and then selling them on eBay to make a little bit of money under the table. Um, and I joined a startup. My first job out of college was actually a startup that was, um, anybody here remember ICQ? Okay. <laughs> who, remembers their, who remembers their number? Hmm. Major prop to you? You didn't have one, okay. Um, anyway, so the founder of ICQ started this company. You guys know those, you guys have heard of this marketing concept, remarketing or retargeting, like the banner ads that follow you around. So one of the founders of ICQ also invented retargeting. And so I joined his startup in 2006 and I was an analyst and then four years into that, I turned to one of my coworkers and I said, I think we can do better. And so we decided to quit and start a, a company doing essentially what this company was doing, but in, in mobile ads, HTML5 had just come out. Um, and that is actually when I first met Jerry, um, because he was an investor in ad tech, I think in large part in that point, and um, I wanted some money. <laughs> How much money did you want? I don't even remember. I think I wanted to raise like probably a million. It was less. Yeah, I think you raised 750 in your first round. No, less than that. No, it was quarter mill, friends and family. Yeah, quarter mill in the fr very friends first Friends and family, yeah. yeah. Yep. And what happened? Um, so we, we raised money from friends. The first fundraise failed. I think I was out for like nine months and I couldn't raise and we ended up raising from friends and family. And then we built some product. Uh, we got a little bit of revenue and then we went back out and were able to raise a Series A that at that time was a million and a half dollars. That was 2012. Wait, are, are you including me in the friends and family? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were in it. Still I wasn't in it. Yeah, I just wasn't friends or family. No. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, and that was led by Graycroft and Inovia at that time. And then I think two years after that, um, we had sold a little product, we had built a little product, and we ended up getting Aqua hired by another Graycroft portfolio company. Does everybody know what Aqua hire means? Well, maybe she does actually say what aqua hire means. I'm going to have Jerry define it, actually. That's when your company is not, is going, it's basically going sideways and you can't, 
grow or sell, and somebody comes along and says, hey, we'd love to have your team. So why doesn't your team come here? We'll pay the VCs back, um, maybe a little bit of money, but it's basically a, a way to continue building what you're building under somebody else's umbrella. Or not. Or just sometimes. Well, sometimes not, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So then, after that? Uh, so after that, I worked for the acquirer for a year. And then I got out, and then I started brainstorming my next company. Did you make money? I think I made, like, maybe a little in a retention bonus. It was very little. And the stock was worth zero. The company that acquired our company went to zero, I think. It did, it did yes. Um, and then, so I started brainstorming for my next company with the person that you and I have in common and a third co-founder that I had gone to high school with. And it is a company that's still around today. It's called Strong DM. Um, it's a... Uh, you guys know how you like log into a website and it says, do you want to create an account, use, use Google, authenticate with Google, authenticate with Facebook. So that concept is called single sign-on. Um, we do that for everything that is firewalled at a company. Servers, databases, Kubernetes clusters, anything that's behind a VPN. And so we sort of pioneered that concept. Um, and at StrongDM, I think I was there for seven years. I stepped down as CEO in November 2021. 2021, yep. Um, at StrongDam, I raised, I think, just under $80 million. Um, I had the head of Sequoia on my board. Uh, Tiger was our Series B investor. Data Collective was in their Google Ventures and stuff. So it was very much like the, the skyrocketing startup in a very sexy space. Amazing. So how did you meet Jerry? <laughs> so you us? pitched a different VC in New York. Um, oh, yeah. And... He introduced you to me, and then I invested, and he didn't invest. That's and then he correct. later complained about how you didn't ask him to invest or something. <laughs> That's so. Explain that. Oh, he just completely. Like, he I. He flaked. When it came to the Series A, I said, "Hey, you know, this is a great company, and you should put some money in." He's like, "Well, why didn't she call me when she was raising her seed round?" I said, okay, <laughs> I have the email. <laughs> but yeah, no. Right, but you invested in her previous company. Well, I invested in both companies. All right, so how did you, so how did, so how That did, was how I met her the first how time. How did the second company come about through this VC instead of Oh, no, no, this, the first company was the oh, VC. The I second see. company, Liz was looking for an idea. She had a team, and we would go and have breakfast once every other week, and she would tell me ideas, mm. and I would tell her they were all bad ideas. And then she finally came up with a really good idea, and I invested in that which wasn't strong DM. It was strong DM 1.0, so the, the company, so the really good idea was this concept of data quality. Like as an analyst, I would open up a spreadsheet and st stuff would look bad, right? It's like if I work for a retailer and all of a sudden there's a Canadian postal code instead of a zip code, right? But something gets shipped to the US instead of Canada. And we didn't understand, me and my co-founders, why data errors like that couldn't be detected earlier, right? Why did it happen all the way at the end of the pipeline? And so we started a company to fix this, and we raised a million dollars in a seed round. Jerry was, I think, the first to commit. Um, it ended up being led by, by Bloomberg's venture arm, Bloomberg Beta. And maybe nine months into that project, uh, we had five or six proofs of concept out there in the world, and we couldn't convert anybody. Nobody would sign a contract. Nobody would pay a dollar for this thing. And my two co-founders turned to me and said, it's time to throw it out. We need to pivot. Um, and so we did. We threw it out. And we started uh, going back through these product development phone calls that we had had at the very beginning of the company and writing down what people were complaining about. And we sort of categorized them into different products. And my CTO built a product or a prototype a week, and me and my other co-founder uh, would sell a, a product a week. And the only metric of success was, will somebody pay at least $1 for this thing? Just $1. Because there's a major difference. I don't care if it's a dollar or a thousand. The difference is somebody putting their credit card down. It means they actually find value in what you're selling. And so Strong DM that you two know today um, uh, was idea number five actually, and it just took off. We sold 28 copies, I think, in three weeks, and, and I went out to raise, uh, I think I called you, and I was like, I think it's time to raise, and we went out and raised a well, seed round. Well, first you sat me down and said, hey, we're, we're, we're shutting down the business you invested in, and we're starting this other business. <laughs> I did, and what did, and what did you, I said, yes, isn't this a great idea, and you said? I said, I, I don't think it's a good idea, so <laughs> it's typical. What did you invest? 
Well, I was already invested. Oh, so I, you're, I, you're, you're like s stuck. So, so when that happens and, a, and, a, and your founder comes to you and they say, you know, that, that money that, that, money that you, you, you gave me for this thing, well, we decided that thing, we're not going to do that thing. We're going to switch. You know, you have no control, right? Like, what's your reaction? Well, I do have some control, right? So I don't have control in the moment. But when she was raising her next round, those investors all called me because I had been an investor previously. So there, the VC always has some control, um, even if it's soft power. Mm. In this case, you know, I said, look, I, I don't think this is a... I don't think this is a good idea, and I gave her my reasons. I said, convince me. And she did. She convinced me. Um, so, you know, I, uh, after that conversation, you know, was very supportive of where she was going, and people would call me and say, what do you think? I said, I think this is amazing. I think that she's a great entrepreneur. So that's, uh, you know, I think if somebody had come along and just said, and just stiff-armed me and said, I don't need your permission, I don't need your acknowledgement of my idea, um, then when people call me and say, what do you think about this founder? I might say, you know, I don't have any comment on this founder, which of course is sort of the kiss of death, right? So, so out of the 80 investments that you've made, like where is this one? Number 60, number 40? Ouch. <laughs> oh, in terms of time or in terms of how good it is? No, no, of all the investments that you've made. You've made, say, about 80 investments yeah. over the past, you know, 30 years. It, well, I mean, it was probably the 60th or 65th investment mm -hmm. I made. And what have you learned? What did you learn that actually made you made made Liz and this investment idea really stick out to you? Well, again, I invested in the first idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, but you know, I think what I invested in was I invested in Liz. I I had invested in her previous company. So the the first company of hers that I invested in, what stuck out to me was that she was building product herself. Um, she was in an area that was, I thought, probably going to be a, a growth area. Um, so I could see how the company could become very big. Um, you know, at that time, I did invest in other ad tech companies, and I have a strategy as well. I don't just go out and look for good companies, right? I mean, that's I do that, but I also have a strategy, a portfolio strategy. I'm investing in a lot of companies. Um, so I had, you know, th this was at the beginning of ad tech, and you all probably take ad tech for granted now where you see an ad that is put in front of you because they think that you're interested in it for the most part, for some reason. Um, or, or, or you're more likely to be interested in it and click on it than other ads. Uh, so this was the, the beginning of that movement. Previous to that, they would just put the same ad in front of everybody. Um, and I had a, a thesis about ad tech and my, and my thesis had five different scenarios where the technology could go and I invested in all five. So this was one of them. Um, it's not that I believed that this, this company was absolutely going to be successful. I said, you know, if this scenario, this at one of five scenarios works, this company will be worth 100 times what I invested. So it, it's a good bet. Um, and that's why I invested in the idea. Um, but I primarily invested in Liz. Uh, and then the second time around, I had watched her build the first company and then sell it. And um, she made mistakes, management mistakes in the first company. Um, and I saw her learn from them. So the second company, I now have a trained entrepreneur. I don't have somebody who's never done this before. I have somebody who's done it before, learned a lot, and will probably be successful in the second company, um, which you know, normally when I invest, I invest in the person's first company. So they've never, some of them have never run anything before, bigger than you know, a four-person department. Um, Liz had run a company. She had hired people. She had fired people. She had got, brought customers in. She had made it work. Um, so this is for a venture investor. You don't see that as often as you'd like. Um, why would you not invest in that? What was your first major disagreement? You know, I'm not a disagreeable person. <laughs> No, and Liz, actually, this, this so Liz can complain about how undisagreeable I am, um, but I, I do have to wield soft power for the most part. You know, if I want what I, if I want people to do what I want them to do, I have to convince them it's what they want to do. So I, I don't get into fights a lot, which is actually one of our biggest fights, or I would say points of contention in the relationship, which actually came out in our in our book, is that sometimes Jerry speaks so softly, in my opinion 
that I actually can't hear him and hear what he wants to tell me, and that's to my detriment. That is frustrating, that you can't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> but but it is, you, so there's a story in the book. Um, I don't know if, any, if anybody has read the book. There's a story in the book. Liz and I were actually at an event a couple years ago, and we were talking to a venture capitalist, and he was complaining about a company that he had invested in. And he said, you know, I've... I, the company is going to zero, it's going to fail, and it's really frustrating because for the past year, I've been telling the founder that what they were doing was wrong and it was going to cause them to fail, and now they're failing because they didn't listen to me. And I was like, really? Like, they just didn't listen? He's like, yeah, I used to, I would call them every week on Friday, and I'd be like, look, you're doing this wrong, you need to do it different, here's how you need to do it. And then they wouldn't do it, and the next Friday I would have the same conversation, and, uh, and after like three months of this, they just stopped answering my phone calls. <laughs> so... I mean, whose fault is that, right? Could he have convinced the entrepreneur to do what needed to be done if he didn't just badger them? <laughs> yeah, I think he could have, right? So this I blame on him. But, you know, if you, the, 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 the reason you can't, you want people to understand the best thing to do if you know it. Uh, and if you, they stop talking to you, you can't do that anymore. So this is, you know, people complain about VCs a lot. Um, and this is one of the things they complain about is that VCs aren't as straightforward as they could be. But there's a reason, right? Like, I can't force you to do something that I know is right. I have to convince you. So let's talk about VC. Because would you call yourself a VC? Yes. So define that. So I'm technically an angel investor. I invest my own money. I've been investing my own money for the last 15 years. Uh, of the 80 companies, the first 25 or so I worked for uh, a corporate and I was the corporate venture capital arm of a Fortune 500 company here in New York. Um, and then I went out and started my own company. After I was unceremoniously escorted out of the building, I, a lot of the people who I had hired decided they no longer wanted to work there, and they went off and wanted to start their own companies, and I started investing my own money in those companies. So that was 15, no, when was that? I guess it was 16, 17 years ago, um, and I've been investing my own money since. But it was important to me that most angel investors are hobbyists. They invest their own money, they think it's exciting. I have friends who are hedge fund managers, very good hedge fund managers who angel invest because their day job is boring, um, or it is after 25 years. Uh, I know a lot of founders who angel invest because they want to support other founders or give back, or I know people who angel invest because they think it's like the lottery, right? Um, but when I started, I said, you know, I'm doing this to make a living. This pays my rent, and I'm going to do it as a professional. So I do consider myself a venture capitalist. I operate my fund the same way a venture capitalist would, other than having to deal with outside investors. And when you bring in, like, so, so obviously your money alone is not going to carry a company like Strong DM to the place where it needs to be. You're not, you're not going to put $80 million into, of your own money into this. Um, at least I imagine you wouldn't. Um, so you need other investors. You need you know, the, the large VCs, the Silicon Valley you know, VCs, Sand Hill Road VCs to come in and dump a bunch of money in. So what's that like? And Liz, I want to ask you, like, like, is it like getting someone, you know, on the one hand, giving you a, a giant bonanza, and on the other hand, dumping a big bucket of cold water in your head? Like, what, what is that like? What changes in that dynamic? Do you, no, he's yeah. asking you. Uh, what changes in the dynamic in terms of the type of person, or? In terms of your company, and how it runs, and how yeah. your relationship with the investors, and? So I raised, I think, two rounds for my first company, and four, one, two, three. Four, four rounds for Strong Dam, I think it's seven maybe at this point. So in total, it's I think just under 100 million. Um, the seed money or the pre-seed money, so I'm talking about today's dollars, right? Pre-seed is a, a million, three million? A money in? Yeah. No, pre-seed is now more like more two, okay, three, I'm going to talk four. about my dollars. <laughs> okay, yeah. so Strong Dam's first round was, was, was a million dollars. The seed round was three million. It was led by True Ventures. Uh, the Series A was, I think, just under 20, led by Sequoia. And then the Series B was 55, led by Tiger. Um, and so, and this is probably because I, I was already 
a, a prior founder, I think to Jerry's point, I was a well-known quantity. Um, and, and so I had a little bit more flexibility than I think first-time entrepreneurs do. And so at Strong DM, you know, my, my pre-seed round, the million dollars that Jerry was a part of, like that was money to take this idea that, that we had and to actually go and prove that it was monetizable, which we did after we pivoted. And then the seed round from True, the $3 million, that was, now go and see if you can scale it, right? Can you get to a million in ARR, uh, annual recurring revenue, two million, three million, which we did. And f so for the first $4 million of the company, it was pretty laissez-faire. We kept it small and tight. We were at most eight people before we raised a Series A. Um, and we had freedom, and we were hitting our numbers, and we were executing, and we were building product, and it was high quality, and we were making a name for ourselves. It was really loose and free. Um, with a Series A of 20 million, which was Sequoia, um, who, who led it, it was you know, there are more expectations set in. The board became bigger. We actually had board meetings. Um, and so there was real structure and rigor there because now, I guess an investor would say to me, the moment you take a penny of venture capital, you're down a path. But for me, that path actually started with the A where it was go big or go home at that point and there was no turning back, especially with an investor, you know, of the, the Sand Hill Road caliber. Um, but. And then my relationship with Jerry, I think, has always been consultative, um, and it became even more so the more money poured in, which means more expectations, which meant, for example, like, after we raised our Series A, me and one of my, me and Skylar, one of my co-founders, went and sat with Jerry, and he ran us through this exercise of how we were ever gonna hit these sales projection numbers, and it turned out we were already nine months behind on hiring. And so that's the sort of trust and, and consultancy I can expect can't expect it from Jerry, he gives it freely, I think. He believes it's part of his, his job, I think, and, and he wants us to succeed. But so the relationship changes, and in my opinion, actually with my pre-seed investors, becomes even more important. That's so interesting. And, it's, um, and for you, I mean, you know, you're becoming an increasingly small piece of the company, but it sounds like you're actually, in some ways, being asked to put more and more time and thought into supporting Liz. And, what, and like, so you go like, well, you have companies like, you know, VCs like Sequoia and, and True, they have, they, have, they have big brand names, you know, you know they, they constantly talk about how they are there to support founders in every possible way, they provide advice and guidance and, and unlock all this value. Why aren't they doing this? Well, so Sequoia never says they're there to support founders. That is absolutely, they never say that. They. People think that because they mishear what Sequoia says. Mm. Sequoia is, is there to support companies, mm. founder or not, mm. right? So Sequoia famously says they fire half of the founders they invest in, right? They said this on their website. Um, the, the person who wrote the foreword for our book, Sandy Lerner, who was one of the co-founders of Cisco, you've all heard of Cisco, uh, she was fired a year after Sequoia invested in her company. Uh, the company went public a year later, so it couldn't have been doing that poorly, um, right? They, but they don't care about founders, they care about making money. That's their job, right? They're investors. So there's a difference. Um, partly it's a difference in how you feel about it, right? So I, I, I do my job because I do want to support founders. I want founders to succeed. And I mean, selfishly, when they succeed, I also succeed because I've invested. Um, but it is important to me that people can do the job, they can, they can get the company out and, out and, and build it and grow it, right? Um, so what happens when somebody like Sequoia invests down the line, uh, the, the relationship on the board becomes much more contentious because, and Liz can tell you detail, or maybe she can't tell you details, um, she's under NDA still. They can read the book. <laughs> That's true. Um, but you can quote the book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> They, you know, so they'll, they'll come in and be like, why, aren't, why didn't you hit that sales number, right? Like, you're, you're not, you're failing. Um, you, know, you, you said you were going to do the sales number when you pitched us, you're not making it. You know, what's wrong with you? Maybe we should find somebody else. Um, now, I invested, you know, I don't know, four years before Sequoia. My, what I own in the company is very similar to what Liz owns, right? So I, I own preferred stock, um, but my preferred stock has a very low preference. So it's much more like common than Sequoia stock, which has a high preference. Uh, so. Now I'm really tied to the founders because if her stock isn't worth anything, my stock's not worth anything, right? So 
I have a different point of view, um, both because I want her to succeed personally, I've been working with her for years, um, but also because Sequoia can succeed while I still fail, right? They can squeeze me out, they can dilute me out. There's lots of things they can do if the founder changes that would screw me, and they would have absolutely no compunction doing that. Uh, so, you know, I, I think um, th there's a difference between the early investors and the late investors in terms of what kind of advice they give, what they care about, um, and how they interact with the people running the company. So this is interesting. We have these a founder, we have an investor, yet the book is titled Founder versus Investor. So I'm kind of at a loss because it sounds like you two are very chummy, you're incredibly supportive, you're kind, you're soft-spoken, maybe too soft-spoken. You know, Liz is out there doing her best, trying out new things, building a team, forging ahead. You know, sometimes not missing her, making her numbers, but you know, she'll figure it out. So why is the book entitled Founder versus Investor? You want to tell the story? Sure. Or so the, the book actually came out of a blog post I wrote. Um, a founder that I'm very close to, uh, that you probably know by now, was fired by their board, <clears throat> um, which I found extremely frustrating. Um, I, I tend to believe the companies where the founder is in charge do better than companies where they aren't. Um, I, I mean, I think that's actually empirically shown, although there's obviously a causality question there. Um, but I, I, for me, especially, when the founder is no longer in charge of the company, I don't have, I, I lose every, I lose all of my contact with the company. I usually don't know the new CEO. The new CEO doesn't owe me anything. They're not friends with me. They haven't worked with me for years. They don't have to tell me anything. Um, I, I've been in situations where the founder has been changed at a company or the founder has been pushed out and a new CEO brought in and the company's gone to raise another round and the new CEO wouldn't tell me how the company was doing. And they're like, you want to invest in the new round or not? I'm like, well, how are you doing? They're like, I can't tell you that. Um, <laughs> literally, yeah. Um, so so it's, it's, a, it's a bad situation for me as an investor. Um, but it's also, you know, you work with somebody for a while, you believe in them and they get pushed out because the new investors think they can put more money, they can make more money by putting their buddy in charge instead of whoever started the company. Um, it doesn't seem right to me. Um, so I wrote this blog post called, Your Board of Directors is Probably Going to Fire You. And, and it's true. Um, it was, I, I, people are like, well, that was a bit of a provocative title. I'm like, well, it's just the facts. I mean, you know, in, in, in truth, more than half of, of founders at startups are fired. Um, and, and they're replaced by somebody else. And, and sometimes this is warranted. I'm not going to say that not every founder shouldn't be fired. I've actually been involved in pushing out two founders, um, one for ethical behavior uh, and the other because he simply would not hire anybody. Um, and the company, I was of the opinion the company could not become large with five people. Um, so, you know, there, there are times where, where, where that should happen. I didn't think this was one of those times. I took an, old, an email that I had sent to, most of the, uh, to many founders when they brought on outside investors on the board saying, look, look, here's how you have to treat your board of directors. And this, the email that how you treat your board of directors came out of this, my experience working for the Fortune 500 company, because the CEO of that company, uh, who I reported to, and I wasn't in the board meetings, but the CEO of that company treated his board of directors very, very professionally. Right? He made sure there was never any surprises. Nobody was going to have a conversation in the board meeting that wasn't pre-planned. Nothing could possibly happen that he didn't already know was going to happen. And this was a widely held company with people he handpicked to be on the board. There was zero chance he was being fired, but he still wasn't taking that chance. Right? So, you know, I think if you are running a company and you have a board of directors who are your boss, they can fire you, you should be very careful about how you interact with them. And a lot of founders believe, because the people on the board are the venture investors, that the venture investors love them. They gave them tens of millions of dollars to run their company. They must love them. Um, and I, I have to explain to people that the venture investors did not give the founder tens of millions of dollars. The venture investors gave the company tens of millions of dollars. And there's a difference. So this was the blog post I wrote. Um, it was pretty popular. It, it actually hit the ha top of Hacker News, um, probably because of the title, and crashed my web server. And uh, then Liz called me. I did, and no web server should ever go down in today's day and age. My web server is a little sleepy, usually. 
Um, and so I, so actually another investor forwarded me this blog post and I read it and I go, what the fuck is this? And so I pick up the phone and I call Jerry and he's like, well, I was angry about this thing that happened. And I said, and we looked at how popular it was and I said, why don't more people talk about this, right? This is stuff that happens all the day, all the time, every day, and nobody talks about it. And there are myriad other things that happen at startups that nobody talks about, it's just behind closed doors. And so we decided to write a book about those things and put it out into the light. And we go through each stage of a company's growth, how you find each other, fundraising, terms, board of director, growth and exits. And we just go back and forth arguing both sides of, of the, same, the same concept. Um, and what was fascinating about the process art actually was that as well as we know each other and for as long as we've known and worked for each other, we learned things about the other's position that I don't think we had, we had known before and certainly had more appreciation yeah. for the other side. And, and the reason nobody would write it, no VC would write this, um, you know, founders write about how bad their VCs are and sometimes they write about how they've made mistakes. VCs generally don't write about any of that. Um, and the reason is because it's a very clubby business. Um, it's, you know, my job as a VC, the, the reason I could be successful was I was an information nexus, right? People would tell me things. Um, and it's, I'm not running a company. I need to know what's happening in the world. I need to know who's raising money, who's leaving a company to start a company, what other, what companies that aren't even, you know, they, they don't have a, a product out yet, what they're doing, how much they raise money for, like what they've been valued at. I need to know these things. And the only way I can find them out is by talking to other VCs. So I would spend half my time talking to other VCs, um, although after this book came out, less so, uh, <laughs> because it pissed off a lot of the other VCs. They, they didn't think that founders should believe anything other than VCs are your best friend. And in fact, the, the forward that Jerry mentioned earlier with the founder of Cisco, we tried to get a venture capitalist to write a counter, a counter forward to her forward in the spirit of the book. Not a single one uh, would say to do it. And we emailed a lot of people. Yeah. So interesting. So Liz, as, as you're raising more money and you, you've read the article, you've seen all the data, you know. So were you just sitting, were sitting around waiting to be fired? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely still under NDA. Um, I think that there are, I think that there's, what do I want to say here? I think sometimes things happen at a company n not because the founder is doing a bad job. I think sometimes ego can get the better of people um, and life happens and shit happens um, and um, so I'm not, I'm not under NDA. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, about two months before Liz left the company, she had raised $55 million from Tiger. Her previous lead investor had said, you can't raise at that price. And Liz said, watch me. Um, and so when she did, the previous lead investor was kind of pissed off because I think they were hoping they could invest at a lower price. Um, and I don't think that this... Uh, had nothing to do with Liz leaving the company. So there's a lot more going on than just people looking to build great companies. I will say this, going back to your question about what changes, the politics change. So I think, so I've been doing this now since 2010, I think was, I, I founded my first company and if you had told me that in addition to being, having to figure out how to be a halfway decent manager so that people didn't hate me and run a company and raise money, but also having to be a master politician with people who have been doing this for 20 or 30 years at the highest levels, I would have said, you're, you're fucking out of your mind. Um, that, that's probably the most surprising thing to me that, that, uh, that I wish I had known when I first started out. Although I think that's true of almost any job. <laughs> I mean, right? Any job where you're at a high level, there is politics. But how many of us get to that high level? I mean... Well, I, I mean, the, the reason you want to be entrepreneurs is so that you can give yourself the CEO job, right? I mean, beats earning it. I'm, I don't... Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no offense. Well, I think everybody in this room wants to be at a high-level job. And is there anybody here who does not want to be at a high-level job, whether it's in a small company or at a large company? 
<laughs> my two instructors over here to my left. I don't know. I so I, I was put into a high-level job when I was about 30 years old at a Fortune 500 company because I was the only person in New York who understood what the internet was at that time in 1996. Um, <laughs> And they needed somebody who knew that. So I got thrust into this position, uh, which I was completely unprepared for. Um, but you know, it was, there was a huge amount of politics. Um, and it, it, it was great. Uh, and then I decided I just, I didn't want to work for, I didn't want that, right? So I went and started my own company. And, and my company, my investing is actually also my own company. I, I, run a, I run a small company, I run a small business. I, my small business is investing in other businesses, but it is still a small business. Um, and I did it because I hate working for other people, right? Everybody I ever worked for was a moron. Not, not objectively. <laughs> objectively, they were all quite smart, but subjectively, I was like, you can't teach me anything, and I don't want to learn it from you anyway. Um, I was an awful employee. Um, and, but I'm an excellent employee for myself. I'm an excellent at working by myself. I'm, I do good work, right? So I just couldn't work, do it for other people and make them happy. Um, and I think that's pretty common among people who go to work for themselves is they don't want to work for other people. I think that's actually the most common reason that I've seen that people become entrepreneurs is because they can't work for other people. What about you, Liz? You like working for other people? You should have seen the arguments we had writing this book. <laughs> you weren't working for me on it. <laughs> so. We were working with each other. <laughs> what was the biggest argument? What was the oh, biggest argument? Oh, Jesus. So... Uh, 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 oh, he has one at the ready. Oh, okay. I absolutely do. <laughs> Jeez, I, my wife should show up here and tell you about the arguments we had. Um, one, we, we, we were, Liz came to my summer house for, to write for a while, and uh, we were writing, we, we had both written pieces and we were trying to integrate them. So if, if the book is a back and forth. It's, I, I, there are a few pages from me, a few pages from Liz, and they mesh. And we took a, it took a really long time to make them mesh. There's, there's a reason no other books are like this, because it was really a pain in the ass. Um, but, so we had each written, written sections, and I had made the first pass at meshing them together. And, uh, and I said, look, you know, they don't really mesh, so we now have to go back and like, change what we've written so that they mesh better, that they, they really are a back and forth. And um, Liz said, you know, I liked it better when my section was uninterrupted. Oh my God, did I? You did, and I, and, and I said, well then why don't you write, you write your own fucking book? <laughs> and then I, I don't think this happened, I don't remember. Uh, I totally, we were sitting at that outdoor coffee shop. <laughs> I was like, we could have it, it could be like one of those books where yours is on one half, then you turn the book over and mine goes the other way. <laughs> yeah. So, but then Liz thought about it for a little while and she realized I was correct. But I was pretty direct that time. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I, I just want to ask like a, a really kind of a nuanced question because I'm actually pop. mortified. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I apologize. <laughs> it, it all worked out. <laughs> so, on a, so Jerry, you came from a corporate investing background, and now you're angel investing. So, what's the difference? Like, what's the difference between investing for a corporate or working at a VC or working at an angel? Like, like, like isn't it all the same? Oh, no. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I liked the company I worked at. I really liked the people I worked for. I didn't, I mean, they kept trying to tell me what to do, but otherwise I really liked them as people. Um, but I, I remember when, so it was bizarre, right, because I'm 30 years old and the CEO of a Fortune 500 company is interviewing me for this job. And it wasn't like, it was not a big job, right, when he hired me because it was in 1996 and the internet wasn't a, as big a deal as it would become in the later years, in the, in the next few years. Um, he was just, it was somebody that had to report to him because there was nowhere else they could, they could report to. But he, so he interviewed me and I, I asked him the question. I said, well, look, I know you want to do this now because everybody's excited about this, but there will come a time where it's not exciting anymore. And what are you going to do then? Because most, comp most corporations, when it becomes less exciting, will just shut down their venture arm. Right? This is just the history of corporate venture arms. It's the buy high, sell low idea. Right? Like Things are really hot. Let's go spend a lot of money. Oh, things are bad. Let's, let's shut it down. Um, this actually worked out great for me, by the way, because when things went down and they decided to shut it down, I bought it um, in, in 2003, uh, which was the very bottom. Um, but you know, he, he 
made all the right noises and said all the right things. And, but you know, in the end, it was very difficult to, a, a company like that has a P&L, right? They have an income statement. And there was a time where, it, first quarter of 2000, um, one of my, the companies I had invested in had gone public. They were raising some more money. They gave us the opportunity to buy in at you know, 7% without the underwriter's discount. Uh, or with, I guess, with the underwriter's discount. So 7% lower than they were going to sell the shares to the public. I went to the um, CEO and I said, hey, we have this opportunity. What do you think? And he's like, well, what do you think? Do you think that this company is worth this price? Now, this was 2000 before the crash. And I said, oh, absolutely not. <laughs> Just no, this company is worth nowhere near where the stock price is. And he said, then why do we still own it? I was like, oh, that's a good point, right? If you're not buying, you should be selling. So we sold it all, and we made a ton of money uh, because it was the very peak. And uh, the controller showed up in my office the, the day after we sold it, and he said, what are we going to do with this? I said, do with what? He's like, well, do with this gain. I was like, I don't know, buy yourself a new suit? I mean, what, what do you mean, what are we going to do with it? It's like $400 million in cash. Um, and he's like, well, we, I mean, how am I supposed to classify this? It's a one-time gain. I said, okay. I mean, I hope it's not a one-time gain, but whatever you need to do. He's like, nobody gives us credit for one-time gains, right? Like, nobody, nobody on the street cares if we have a one-time gain. But a year from now, when we don't have the one-time gain, they're going to care. It's like, you're just, you're, you're screwing everything up. I was like, oh, sorry for the $400 million, sorry. Um, and then the next quarter, I had to write off a company. And uh, the CEO came and said, look, we, we, the company was failing. And if we shut it down that quarter, I could get back half the money. If we waited another quarter, I'd get back a quarter of the money. And if we had two quarters, I'd get back none of the money. It seemed like a good idea. Um, the, the CEO said, we can't do it this quarter. I said, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, we can't do it this quarter. We're pretty tight on earnings. We can't do it this quarter. So we'll have to do it next quarter. I'm like, but then it's a bigger loss. He's like, well, that's just what we have to do. I'm like, so there's, there's really different, they, they think differently about this stuff, right? I mean, it's, it, they're not in it. You know, I always question Google Ventures because Google Ventures can't possibly make enough money for it to make any difference to Google, right? In the slightest. Like it does, it's just, it's really a place where they can put people who don't really want to work at Google anymore. It's like, oh, no, no, stay here. Go do this. Because it makes zero difference to Google as a, co as a company. And yet they still do it. But when Google has any, any pressure on its stock, they will stop doing it. Um, so it's a, it's a very different environment. VCs, on the other hand, they have a pool of money. It's their job to invest it. They have to invest it or they're out of a job, right? It's their only job. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, the, one of the mistakes I made at my startup, we, we took money from somebody who wasn't a professional VC as the lead investor. Um, and when it came time to screw us, he didn't care how it looked, right? He didn't care that we were influential people in the industry and we were going to tell every single entrepreneur not to take their money because he didn't care. We were, a VC would have cared. So I generally, much as I liked working at the corporate uh, venture arm and, and all the good I think we did in those few years, I don't recommend people take corporate money. Um, I recommend they take actual professional venture capital money. Um, you know, angel investors are great. Um, they're really great right at the beginning because we are willing to make bets that venture capitalists won't. Like, I think you asked, what do you, what do, you do before you have a product? And that's what I do, right? I invest in people who might have great ideas. Um, I don't invest after the product is already built. Um, and that's, what I think, generally what angels do. The problem with angels is, so I've been angel investing, I don't know, 15 years or so. There is nobody that was angel investing when I started that is still angel investing. So the, angel investors just, they turn over quickly, right? They do it for a couple of years, they lose some money, they decide to go lose their money in some other way, right? Um, there's just not a lot of people who do it professionally. Yeah. And then the people who actually say, we're gonna invest, we're gonna invest, we're gonna invest, but they're afraid to pull the trigger and they string you along for months. Yeah, right? So you, you, you want to find people who actually know what they're doing um, because this, this, I, this, have anybody seen the movie Wedding Crashers? Yeah, yeah of course you have. Um, so there's a great scene, right, where they pull up their first wedding and they get out of the car. Like, okay, let's get our story straight. They're, they have the tuxedos on and they say, uh, okay, all right, we're brothers from New Hampshire, we're venture capitalists. <laughs> right? And, and the reason they say this is because nobody can say you're not, right? You could all go out there and be like, I'm a venture capitalist, and nobody can say you're not, right? Because how could they prove you're not, right? So it's th this way that people say they're angel investors. I think people aren't an angel investor until they actually write a check. Once they write a check, they're an angel investor. Before that, they're 
somebody who wants to be an angel investor. Um, but there's plenty of people who will say they're angel investors who don't write checks, right? And it's impossible for you as an entrepreneur to know that unless you know other people who can tell you. So Liz, there, when, there was a very nanosecond in my career where I worked for an, a corporate investor. Mm. And with the argument, one of the arguments that we'd make to our potential portfolio companies is we can open up our business development channels to you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. Say more. Like, did you ever? Did you ever think about it? Like, did you ever, for a moment, think about taking corporate money or? Percent? I have. I have Strong Dam has a corporate investor. Oh. Um, it is uh, so the corporate investor is, is Hearst actually. Uh, Hearst has a, a, a women-focused uh, pre-seed fund. I guess it's called Hearst Lab. It's run by their the their uh, chief legal officer Eve Burton, who also sits on the board of Intuit. And, and it's a great fund and they're, they're amazing people. Um, and one of the hooks for Hearst was, because Strongdam was, is a ve was a very hot company and so we sort of had people knocking down our door. And so when I said, well, why should I take your money? And the answer was we have, Hearst I think has 270 subsidiaries. Like they're in things that you wouldn't even believe they're in like airplane information systems. And they own, um, Fitch, like Fitch credit ratings, like they're, they're just everywhere, they're not just media. And I was like, this is great. But the truth of the matter is that these people are, right, so Eve is making investments and her team isn't going to be able to walk every single portfolio company into every single subsidiary and say, buy this product. She has political capital that she can't spread too thin. And at the same time, I actually need to add value to these companies if they're gonna buy it. And so I as an individual have to sell into every single division myself and corporate sale or like corporation sales, enterprise sales is not something that I know as a company that's raised two or three or four million dollars. Um, enterprise sales takes a long, a long time to figure out and your own sales motion takes time to figure out and you have to hire sales people and mostly they're all bad. Um, and so it actually, puts pressure, in my opinion, on the company at a point when it's not necessarily the best, the best thing for them. I think we sold into two or three divisions and it took us like three or four years to pull it off and it was, I don't know, maybe 200,000 in ARR, wasn't worth it. So if you ever take money from a corporate investor, and I was a corporate investor, our money was just as green as anybody else's money. Um, it smelled the same, right? It's fine, but if they promise you that they're gonna bring you customers, Say this, say, okay, well, how about you get equity based on how many customers you bring me? <laughs> and they absolutely will not do that. They'll say it's because of accounting or whatever, but they, they, you could make it work in accounting, they just, they won't do it because that's not their job, right? The person who's in charge of investing was somebody like me who was some kid reporting to the CEO. Nobody was, I had like one person reporting to me. Nobody else owed me anything in the company. Like, I couldn't, conv I couldn't tell them to use the products. They weren't going to listen to me. In fact, they were kind of pissed off that I was investing in people who were in some way competing with them, right? So after the first, like, six months, I stopped promising people that I could bring them customers because I knew I couldn't. Um, but people will still do it, right? Because they want, they want to be the investor. But it's almost always not true. <laughs> so Liz, what startup? What's the next startup? I'm brainstorming now, actually. I don't have, I have 80 ideas. None of them are good. <laughs> and is, is Jerry your thought partner? I don't think I've shared m many, I've shared one with you maybe. Liz isn't serious about starting a company yet. I'm not? No, you're not. Oh. But he'll be my first phone call. And if he tells me that it's a stupid idea, I will 100% listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, from your lips to God's ears. Yeah. <laughs> All right, can I open up the questions? Um, Jeffrey. Uh, so my question is for Liz. Yep. So Liz, what is success to you being a founder? And, you know, from so, arts class, we know that, um, you know, startups, it's a hard life. Right? And since you've gone through this many times, is it an IPO? Is it waiting for a company to, to buy? What is it to you? So I'm going to change the question slightly. I'm going to sort of answer the question of why would I, why do I do it? Because I think that's almost more important. Because success, 
at the end of the day, I only control what I control, right? So, so it might be that I can't take a company to IPO, that I have to sell it, and that that's the, the monetary number. So the, my first company, uh, which was called Media Armor, the first one Jerry invested in, I started it because I thought I could do better than the really smart people I was working for, and I think I had a chip on my shoulder there. And there was a greenfield opportunity in mobile. Um, and then with Strong DM, and I, I fucked up so badly, <laughs> and then, but we got it over the finish line, and, and then with Strong DM, I had a team that augmented um, some parts of my abilities that needed rounding out. I found a really, really good CTO, and then the person in charge of marketing had more sales experience than I did. Um, and the point of that company, the reason why I did it is because I knew I could do better than the first, and I crushed it. And so the second one, I actually, you know, maybe the reason why I'm not seriously thinking about a company yet or struggling to find it as I don't actually know what my why is on the third one. Does that answer the question okay? Okay, cool. So from my point of view, Liz is extremely competitive, um, which is good. Uh, and, I, and I think in both companies, she wanted to win. She used to call me with the second company. She'd be like, am I, am I the most valuable company in your portfolio yet? i say, well, not yet. She's like, okay, I'll call you back in a month. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> From uh, having watched Liz from the very beginning, she is incredibly, she's a definition of persistence and determination, and um, it oozes from her. And it, just one of the things that really tremendously impressed me. Do you want to tell the story? Do you want me to? So the, you, you want to talk about persistence. So Art very delicately, I think, told me to fuck off a few years ago. <laughs> so I don't think you ever did. No, you just got annoyed, the emails. So at StrongDM, the way that we got to, I think our first few million in ARR was warm introductions to heads of infrastructure, or heads of DevOps, or CTOs at a very particular type of company, which means I, would, I, had these, uh, I had these people working for me who would go through my LinkedIn and find out who could be a buyer at a company that was like connected through Jerry. And then they would email Jerry and say, hey, Jerry, you know all these people. Will you forward an email to them to see if they'll take an intro? And we did this every week, waves of emails going out. And to the point where, like, I mean, Art, I'm sure he got 100 emails from me. And it was, at one point, he was, and probably Skylar, my co-founder, too, he was just like, hey, you got to stop asking me for introductions. And so success actually ended up being the definition is how many people said stop emailing me this week because I was persistent in the pursuit of revenue. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, so, so when there were just three people, Skylar and I sat down, I don't know if you know this, Skylar and I sat down and went through my LinkedIn I'm sure. and my Rolodex and I gave him everything I had. And I'm like, well, I'm, wait, then at some point I just, I'm not an investor in your company. I'm not getting anything out of this. I'm not getting a sales commission. I happen to like Liz and I think this is great for the value of the, of the New York City tech startup. Do you know what we started doing? He didn't tell you? No. If we closed a customer, we started giving people half of the deal for the first year. So we closed some massive contract and somebody got like a $50,000 check. <laughs> well, wow, I feel really good You should good call now. you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was, I was indirectly an investor. Yes. <laughs> We're paying you back now. Thank you so much, Art. <laughs> Liz, anytime. There was a question over here. Michael. Uh, back to my original question. What's the most annoying thing founders do during a pitch that you would view as incorrect? There's plenty of things that people do that are annoying. Um, <laughs> but the thing that actually I, I really think is the wrong thing to do in a pitch, I have founders come in and they... they they tell me what they think, I, that's the question I always ask is, what do you want this company to look like in five years, right? And it's, it's a question about ambition, right? Do you want to build a big company? Do you not really care about building a big company? Do you think this company can be a big company, right? And so they'll say like, well, I think it could be like $30 million in revenue, but that's, that's my conservative plan. We'll definitely hit that. And I think it's real, a real mistake to come in with your conservative plan. Like this was 100% because A, I don't believe it, I think that's, you're, it's baloney, right? You're not telling me your conservative plan. But the other thing is, I'm looking for outliers, right? And, and outliers aren't outlying ideas. They're not outlying execution. They're thing, everything in the universe suddenly aligned and you became a big company. So tell me, if everything in the universe aligns, how big a company can you be? Because I know one out of 20 of my companies will get that. 
And if, one out of, if it's one out of 20, then I can be like, all right, so I need this to be a 50x, right? So I can make money. And if you can't show me how you could potentially be a 50x company for me, I'm just not gonna invest. So don't go in there with like, here's my 100%, I planned this out for five years, this is exactly what's gonna happen. That's not what's gonna happen. I, of the companies I've invested in, the 80 companies or so, I think one of them has actually ended up doing what they said they were gonna do in the first meeting. And that was just pure chance that they did that. I mean, everybody else had to change something, right? And, and that's what I expect to happen. That's what's gonna happen if you start a company in, a, in a, a field where you can make a big company, right? I mean, if you start a law firm or a dry cleaner or a restaurant, you can probably predict what's gonna happen to some extent. If you start a high growth potential company, you absolutely cannot. So tell me what, what, the, what the outside scenario is. That's what I wanna know. I think there's an important detail here of, like when you read the book, Jerry says, you know, I require a pitch deck before I see, take a meeting. And so, um, and Liz, has her 11, I don't, and one of those is I don't send pitch decks. So why do you require pitch decks? And now, I mean, Liz, you have to be very lucky because you got through somehow through, this, through the eye of the needle. But um, she had a pitch deck for her first company. And, and she sent it to me before I invest, before I met her. Did I? Ah. You did. I still have it somewhere. Um, <laughs> why do I require a pitch deck? I, I because I'm, just a little slow. Like I, I, I need to think about something for a little while before I can have questions. Like if you just come out and here's my idea in 15 minutes, and so what do you think? I'll be like, I don't know. I don't know what to think. I'm still absorbing this, right? So for me personally, I just I can't work that way. And then the second thing is, look, I get 10 deals a day in my in my inbox, right? Which is not that many, right? For a VC, of those 10. Every day I usually say no to 10 of them, right? Because they're just not what I do, right? They're like, I, for some reason recently, the past two weeks, I've been getting 10 a day from India. I, I, somebody in India put my email address out there and everybody's sending me their, their idea. I don't invest in companies in India. I don't know anybody in India. I mean, I know a couple people, but I, I can't do diligence to them. I, I, I don't know the environment, the legal environment, the financial environment. I would be a bad investor there, right? It would be a, a mistake for me to invest there. So. I say no to all of them. Um, so the reason I want to pitch deck is I want to be able to know if I should spend the time on the call with you because there's a good chance I'm just, it's not what I do. Not that it's a bad idea, it's just not what I do. Um, and I don't want to waste your time, that's what I say, but I also don't want to waste my time. Um, I don't want to waste time. So I, I, I see a lot of pitches, I want to spend, times on the one, spend time on the ones that I might invest in. Um, and I know this is, well, Liz can tell you her side of that, but it's just what I do. I, I also, like, don't send me videos. I won't watch them. I hate watching video. Um, don't, you know, it's, I, I like a pitch deck. It's what I'm used to. Definitely send videos. Um, <laughs> I think the challenge... Delete. delete. <laughs> the, the challenge is this. I, <clears throat> associates are probably reading emails that you send unless you've been, you're a good enough founder to get in front of a partner. And if you send a pitch deck, then you are giving them all the opportunity in the world to say no, right? And everybody is worth two or three minutes. And so I'm gonna pretend I'm not the founder that I am for a second because I didn't even have a pitch deck for my last round. I wrote a one and a half piece of paper and sent it in a PDF to people. Um, uh, to me, it's a couple sentences on what the, the company does. Um, maybe three at most, and a link to, I think now Loom is the popular one, I'm seeing this all the time, it's a link to a Loom video product demo, even uh, Figma or Envision mockups or whatever you're using to, to bring it to life um, with a little bit of the round. I totally understand Jerry's perspective about not wanting to watch video. I hate video too, I, I would probably delete it as well. well but, I was hold on, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think the question as a founder is your job is to give yourself the best opportunity to get in the room with venture capitalists. And your goal is not to sell somebody in the first email or the first meeting. Your goal is to get in the room or to get to a second meeting. Your goal is the next meeting. And so how can you do it in a way that lets you hold some semblance of control? And the reason why I love fundraising and the reason why I became good at fundraising is because I've learned how to exact control over the process and not let 
venture capitalists tell me how they want things done, I found a way to marry the two. Yeah, and I think that's great for you. Um, but look, I, I'm not, you know, you're selling something. I'm not buying something, I'm investing in something. I, I also, I mean, like, when we used to have presidential debates, I wouldn't watch the debate, I would read the transcript the next day. I, I think there are certain ways that people interact with each other where they're more convincing, whether or not that's warranted. Um, and I don't want to be convinced, right? I want to assess what's being done. So it's just, you know, for me, it's much easier to, to read the pitch deck and be like, okay, what do I think about this objectively? And then I'll get on a call and say, okay, let's talk about, don't read me the pitch deck. Let's just, I've got questions, right? And, and I'll ask questions. And for me, that's just more productive. I get that on the other side, you may want to convince me to do something I wouldn't normally do. I could never do that. <laughs> All right, so we have a few more questions. Um, we need to wrap at five. So um, let me take in the back. Thank you. This semester we've been talking about leading disruptive technologies, specifically AI and machine learning. And I just wanted to get your understanding about if you are a founder building outside of AI or you're an investor investing outside of an AI thesis, how do you kind of ride the AI wave? Thank you. I can tell you that every single pitch I've seen in the past six months has said they're an AI company, um, even when they're not. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's tempting to try to get people's attention by using AI, um, although I, I think that's ne that strategy is actually, within the next three months, will backfire on you um, because there's... Uh, it's like saying you're a web company back in 1996. Like everybody is going to use some sort of machine learning if they have any data to use it on. It's just not a distinguishing thing anymore. Um, it, unless you are actually building your own LLM, your own model, you're not an AI company. You're using AI in your company. Um, you know, this, when I started investing, people were like, oh, "We're an internet company." Um, nobody would say today that they're an internet company unless they provide internet services to homes, because Every company has internet, right? They use the internet. It's like saying, like, you're an electric company because you have electric lights in your building, right? It's like just... So I, I think, you know, they're, they're definitely... <sighs> VCs have been looking for the new thing since the iPhone because it, it is certainly easier to make money when there's a platform. You know, uh, when I started venture investing back in 96, 97, the web was new, right? It was new. It, pretty, like, it was a couple years old, the, being able to use the web commercially, and every single idea was a good idea. Right? I'm going to open a bookstore on the internet. That's a good idea. I'm going to open a record store on the internet. That's a good idea. Like every idea was a good idea, right? Because there was a new platform, right? So with AI, I think VCs are hoping that this new platform will make every idea a good idea. Uh, I don't think that's actually true at this point. It may be true in two years. Um, but this is why VCs will take any pitch that says AI, right? It's not rational. But, you know, VCs aren't necessarily rational that way. I didn't answer your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> one, more, one more question. Interesting thing on the uh, taking VC money from corporates. So when I raised before, I actually only ever raised from professional VCs. And I don't know if that was accidental or just the way it seemed to the cookie crumbled that way. I felt that those corporate ones, so one of them, let's call them Tools & Co., and I got a sort of negative vibe from them. And, uh, and another startup was a sort of consultancy like one of the big consultancy things, and they suggested with investing that we move in their office and help their clients out at, for free rates in return for investing. And I thought, wow, that just makes us like a consultant of your company. Is there ever an example of where it's good to take those corporates? Because I know in several projects, you know, a lot of these VCs, you know, hotel and corporations, things like that, they're always saying it's better to have that. If you're doing some kind of hotel thing, you know, you want to get, you know, Marriott, Hilton, one of those big brands on your thing. If you're doing like industry 4.0, that kind of stuff, you want kind of one of those people in there. Um, I never had them in there and it didn't seem to work out for me, but it sounds like you guys were suggesting it's a good thing and that would have been awful to have one of those people in there maybe. Yeah, so, so I have, I think cor corporate money, like the Hearst example I'm describing, right, it sort of forces a company to maybe mature earlier and do a lot of hard work that isn't necessarily right for that stage. There's corporate money, like I can take, like there are venture arms of companies that are 
adjacent to me, so like adjacent to StrongDM would be Okta or CyberArk or, or uh, Toma Bravo or any of these PE holding companies. And that is interesting. It, it's an interesting idea because the founder could sit there and say, oh, you're going to put a str strategic money in and that would be a first option for an acquisition later on. But it also comes with problems when it comes to raising more money or people blocking things. I've also seen, I think, which is closer to the example you're describing, I've seen customers with huge, who, are, who are signing a two, three, four million dollar deal with a startup saying, well, I want a warrant to invest on your next round or I want to invest on a convertible note, let's say. And that also becomes problematic because do you really want your customer, your market customer to know how much of your revenue they are, how you're doing? Not so much. So, I don't personally reach for it in, I, I don't believe I would reach for it in any case. I, I could be wrong in an example coming up, but to me I would rather just have unfettered traditional venture capital. I, I think um, the same considerations you should think about with any investor apply to corporate venture capital, right? So who's the person, what value can they add besides money? What control will they have, right? So. The problem with corporate venture capital is not that there's something wrong with corporate venture capital. The problem is it's often not the best people, I'm sorry if anybody here is corporate venture capital, because they don't get paid as much as people who work for venture capital funds, or they don't get carry usually, they get, they're paid a salary. So if you're any good at it, you do it for a few years, then you go and work for a venture capital fund. Right? So people may not be as good. Um, the mission of the, the corporate venture capital will, will change over time because they like to buy when things are great and they like to not buy when things are bad, so um, you know, you're, you're subject to their cyclical business. Um, but the flip side is that they might have expertise that venture capitalists don't have, and venture capitalists don't generally have a lot of expertise, right? If venture capitalists are good at, at, what they, at their job, at investing in companies, they're not good at your job, which is running a company or knowing the industry. So if you take money from, if you're a semiconductor company and you take money from Intel Capital, they might have a lot of really valuable expertise in semiconductor manufacturing that you could use. Like that partner who's investing in you might. But this is what you need to know is who's the person who's going to be there that I talk to and what do they know? What advice can they give me over time? And it, it may be, you know, I like to think that when I was at the corporation investing in companies that were actually competitors to the companies that, that the, the corporation owned, that we had some good advice because we understood the market. Right? And, and other VCs didn't. Um, no, that might just be self-serving, I don't know. But uh, there, there's definitely the, the opportunity to utilize the people who are investing. And I think you should think about that. Who is the, not who is the firm, but who is the partner? Do I want this person involved in my company as a partner in my company, right? Because they will be. Um, this, is, this is why Liz writes in the book, you know, that um, she only deals with partners. Never associates. Yep. Um, so I think this is it. Um, I want to uh, just uh, um, actually call out something that, that Jerry talked about that is going to be very important for Saturday. So in our executive um, seminar, every student is doing a three semester long project, an innovation project. And um, on Saturday, they're pitching, it's like a progress presentation, pitching for feedback, and it's going to be a persevere, pivot, or restart right, for the people who are evaluating the projects. Um, but it's about pitching for feedback and pitching for advice. But mostly it's that you're there so you can help people understand what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it. And I think that's really the important thing. And I think, you know, it's uh, just this, it's such a oppor great an opportunity and it's such a treasure to have you guys come here and share your experience and knowledge with everybody here um, because it is directly applicable to what they're doing. So um, I just want to give, have everybody give, give them a huge round of applause.